Once we've got the chi-square test statistic and the p-value, we're going to do a follow-up analysis, which means that we want to look at which of the different values contributed to significantly to the chi-square test statistic. So what we're going to do is first look for the big differences. And in addition to the big differences, remember, because they're divided by the expected, we need to look for the ratios, the largest ratios. So if we've organized it nicely in a table, then we can take a look at this mini tab output and see which individual component contributed the most or which ones contributed to the, the most to the chi-square test statistic. And looking at the output, we see that just two of the nine components that make up the chi-square test statistic contribute about three quarters of the total chi-square value. So you can see that the, the ones that are boxed up are the ones that contributed most significantly. So what this means is that the sale, sales of Italian wine are strongly influenced or affected by the what music is being played. Notice that on this mini tab output, we do have the chi-square test statistic value, the degrees of freedom listed, and the p-value to three decimal places. So remember when you do see the computer output, you want to be able to read something like this and be able to interpret it or use it for your conclusion if you're given this something like this on a test. We know that there have been some studies that we've looked at that compared proportions of successes for two at a time. That's what we looked at in chapter 10. We, we studied when the null hypothesis of P1 is equal to P2 or P1 minus P2 is equal to zero. Okay, Either one of those statements means the same thing. And the chi-square test for homogeneity allows us to test multiple proportions all being equal to each other. So the null hypothesis in this case is saying that there's no difference in the proportions for all the different treatments or all the different groups. The alternative hypothesis says that at least, you know, we typically say at least one is different, but really at least two proportions are different. And we need to be very careful the way that we state the alternative hypothesis because it doesn't mean that all the proportions are different. It does literally mean that at least one, which means really at least two, are different. And that's the way we need to be phrasing our alternative hypothesis. Okay, we have another example, and this example begins on page 710 in your textbook. So go ahead and pause the video so you can either read the information on this slide or on page 710 in your book. We have three different treatment options, drug I don't know how you say that, desipramine, lithium, and the placebo for control. And we're checking to see if they had a relapse into cocaine usage. So we have our bar graph to make a comparison between the three treatments. Remember that it's a proportion or a percentage of how many relapse so that we can determine a good comparison. It doesn't matter how what the number was, it matters what the proportion was. We state our hypotheses, and our hypotheses say that we want to perform a test that the proportions are all equal, so there's no difference in the relapse rate for the three treatments, and our alternative hypothesis is at least two of the proportions are different. So that means that there is a difference between what treatment they got and whether or not they relapsed. We give a statement about what our parameter of interest is. So our parameter of interest, the actual proportion of chronic cocaine users, like the ones in this experiment who would relapse under the different treatments. And we've determined an alpha of 0.01. We've talked about in class how we, we give a, very, a smaller alpha like 0.01 when it comes to safety or health or uh, side effects, things that affect people adversely. And so this is why we see a tighter alpha in this example. So the next step after the state is the plan. If conditions are met, we're going to conduct a chi-square test for homogeneity. And we know that because when we look at it, our alternative hypothesis is that at least one is different. Our null hypothesis is that all the proportions are the same. We had assigned subjects randomly to the different treatment groups, and then we check the large sample size. Remember, this means calculate the expected counts for each one of the six groups involved and make sure that they are all at least five to meet the condition. And then we check 
the independent rule in this case we're looking to see we, we know we're doing it without replacement and also each one is an individual unless there were family ties or something like that we can assume independence and for that remember we usually use the 10 percent rule because we're sampling without replacement then we get to the due condition or i'm sorry the due step and we're going to expand our chi-square we can do this in our calculator using the matrix feature in your graphing calculator and if you need to find how to do that take a look at page 705 the technology corner and it describes in detail how to create the matrix of observed or your sample values how to create the expected value matrix and how to run the chi-square test on that so once we've got that done we we calculate our chi-square value and we want to calculate the corresponding p-value remember degrees of freedom is the number of variables so we have uh, the three different treatments so three minus one is equal to two and then we have the two groups whether they relap or don't relapse and so that's two minus one so two times one is two our degrees of freedom is two we either look on the table or use the chi-square test statistic value and the degrees of freedom in our chi-square CDF function in our graphing calculator and we come up with a p-value that is a very small p-value and in this case it is less than our alpha so we reject the null hypothesis we have sufficient evidence to conclude the true relapse rates for the three treatments are not all the same so it does matter what treatment they get does have an impact on whether or not they relapse and that is the conclusion for this example we're going to take a look now at the other type of chi-square test and this one is called the test of independence or the test of association and what we want to do is determine whether the two variables the column variable and the row variable have independence are they independent from one another or are they associated so let's take a look at the definition here another common situation that leads to a two-way table is when a single random sample of individuals is chosen from a single population and then classified according to two categorical variables in that case our goal is to analyze the relationship between the variables so we're not looking at different treatments we're looking at different values from the same population so this example is on page 713 and it's associated with heart disease and blood pressure so read that example on page 713 and then turn the video back on so that we can proceed with the example what we're looking at in this case is the presence or absence of coronary heart disease and whether or not it relates to anger levels based on a test let's see what is it say? a Spielberger tray anger test and the and, and we're trying to just find is there a relationship between these two values these two variables or not and remember these are a group of people that were classified by both of these variables and split up amongst these different cells so we have a pretty large sample size 8474 what we're going to do is to try to determine whether or not they're related or associated or independent of one another is we're going to of course calculate all of the expected values and then we're going to expand the chi-square summation notation the, that formula for chi-square so what we have here are the conditional distributions we've looked at the distributions for each of the anger divisions and see how they're split amongst coronary heart disease or no coronary heart disease once we've got that done we have a little graph that shows that there does appear to be a, a pretty big difference in their anger rating and their resulting proportion of coronary heart disease so we see a clear trend as the anger score increases so does the percent who suffer heart disease a much higher percent of people in the high anger category developed coronary heart disease and in the moderate and the low anger categories we want to be able to run the test so of course we start with state and that means that we're defining our null hypothesis you always set up the null hypothesis assuming that there is no relationship or no association or that there is independence between the two variables our alternative hypothesis says 
they are not independent or there is an association between anger level and heart disease are two variables in the population of people with normal blood pressure. So that's how we're going to state our state. The next thing that we're going to do, of course, is test our conditions. And we have random large sample size and independent conditions still. Once we've calculated those, we're going to calculate our, our in our do, uh, the chi-square value. We can use our calculator for that. Remember, looking up the p-value is going to depend on the degrees of freedom. And the rest of the mechanics are really the same as the test of homogeneity. It's just when we use homogeneity and when we use independence is different, so get that straight. And the best way to do that is to look at the reading. So we come up with our observed, uh, that's our sample, what happened in our sample. We calculate the expected. Remember, if you look at that matrix, those matrix instructions on for the graphing calculator, you're going to then be able to put the observed in the matrix, then run the chi-square test, and it's going to create the expected table for you. It's also going to create all of the differences uh, and, and add those up. So here's our state. Remember, we have to give our two hypotheses, our alpha level and the parameter of interest. We're looking at the plan, which is the different conditions and then the do where we expand it out and you can see that this is formatted as one two skip a few 99 100 so the first one the second one dot 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 and the last one we only had let's see we only had six to calculate anyway so it's really not any big deal but this is a, a slight shortcut we end up with a chi-square test statistic of a little bit over 16 after we calculate degrees of freedom we either go to our calculator or to the table to calculate the p-value, and we end up with a p-value that is very small, 0 0.00032. So our conclusion is it's much less than 0 0.05, our alpha level. So we reject the null hypothesis and conclude that the anger level and the heart disease are associated. Because remember, our null hypothesis was that there is no association, or it can be phrased that they are independent of one another. Okay, so use chi-square tests wisely. And what this is referring to is that although the mechanics are the same for both, we really need to be conscious of when we use each one of them. I'm going to recommend that you pause on this slide, read it carefully, and take notes on this slide so that you have a, a comfortable understanding about choosing the correct chi-square test. Additionally, on page 719 of your textbook, there's a good example about choosing the, the right chi-square test. I think it will be helpful if you read through that as well. Now that we're at the end of section 11.2, we have three different chi-square tests under our belt. We know how to use two-way tables to summarize data on the relationship between two categorical variables and how to calculate the conditional distributions for each one of those. We know how to run the chi-square test of homogeneity and also when to choose the test of homogeneity, how to format the entire test. Also, we know how to format the and word the test of association or independence, and that's all the way from the state, the plan, the do, conclude. We know how to calculate our expected values and how to calculate a chi-square test statistic, both by hand and in our calculators, and we know how to check conditions and do a follow-up analysis so that we can say which ones contributed the most. That is it for chapter 11. Hope you enjoyed, hope you do well on the test, and I'll see you back for chapter 12.